So today we are going to talk about uh, Scrum at scale. So we all know that, that Scrum is, uh, the ideal Scrum size really is not three to nine practitioners. But what happens when a Scrum team gets larger than that? What, what happens when development uh, involves dozens or hundreds or even thousands of people? Well, we can't handle uh, all of the issues just in an hour, but we will talk about uh, part of this kind of triumvirate of people and culture, practices, and tools. Now, it makes sense that I talk a bit about tools uh, coming from TaskTop um, and, uh, and my background. I have 30 years of, of development in, in, uh, and uh, delivery experience. I've done all sorts of jobs from being an engineer, engineering manager, uh, even a marketing executive. Um, I am at TaskTop currently, um, but I have a strong alliance to Mr. Dave West over at Scrum.org. I'm uh, certified by them as a professional Scrum Master, and Dave and I go back over a dozen years uh, to 2002 when we worked together at Rational Software. Well, Dave, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, Betty. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm excited to talk about um, Scrum at Scale and uh, really some of the impacts that we've seen about Scrum being used in enterprises and seeing how enterprises are trying to focus on growing Scrum in their enterprise. Now, I come at this from a lot of different perspectives. Like Betty, I've had a number of years in, in the industry, but perhaps three roles that you all might be interested in. One is I was a, um, a VP at uh, Forrester Research, so I was an analyst and research director at Forrester, uh, uh, owning the app dev space. So I did a lot of research on Agile, on Agile at scale, on Agile growing in the enterprise. That was my area of interest. I then left uh, Forrester and joined uh, this motley crew at, at TaskTop, and I say that hey, hey. from love, from love, obviously, and uh, helped grow the organisation, get VC funding, and uh, and put in many of the practices and uh, and, and strategy that uh, TaskTop's executing. So I'm not unbiased. I do have an affinity to TaskTop because I honestly believe, and still believe, that integrating the life cycle is incredibly important for delivering agility at scale. Now I joined uh, Scrum.org in October to run Scrum.org to be the product owner for Scrum.org, that's um, working for Ken Schwaber, really continuing my mission of helping people deliver software just a little bit better, which has really been my mantra since, um, since I, I built my own mission after going to one of those, very much those personal motivation kind of uh, presentations. You must have a personal mission, and I did. So let's, let's move on to the, to the next slide, Betty, and talk a little bit about Scrum.org. So interestingly, Scrum.org is an organization it's mission-based. It's uh, run by um, Ken, well, it's founded by Ken, though day-to-day -day I, I run it now. Uh, and its mission isn't actually Scrum-based, which is a surprise to everybody. It's improving the profession of software development, which really Scrum is a tool, as as many other tools, uh, to helping you improve the way you deliver, deliver software. Moving to the next slide, please, Betty. Now, that means that we, as the home of Scrum, and I, I believe we, we really are, some of you may have attended last week, uh, Ken and Jeff presented the updates to the Scrum Guide with the new values, the five values, uh, are now actively in the Scrum Guide. And we're very, uh, very much the, the home of Scrum. We obviously maintain, and with Jeff and Ken, the, the Scrum Guide, we continue to drive Scrum and uh, advanced Scrum, and we'll be talking a little bit about that later. And one thing that's interesting on this slide, you know, over a million people have taken assessments through Scrum.org. Now, that might be the same guy taking it a million times. We hope he'll pass it one day. No, but uh, it just shows you the magnitude of, of the reach that we have. As Betty said, she's a PSM1, and uh, 65,000 people, over 65,000 uh, thousand people have taken that. So it just shows you the sort of magnitude of our our connection with the industry and the and, and the profession of, of, of Scrum practitioners, which I think you know provides some context for today's conversation. Please, uh, the next next slide, um, because when we talk about Scrum, um, interestingly, Scrum is currently twenty. Uh, it, it turns 21 on October the 19th, uh, 2016. We're going to have a party, cake, champagne, all sorts of things. And um, those 21 years, it's gone from being very much when I first came into contact with Scrum. I was the RUP product manager. You know, I just just before I actually started working with Betty, and um, the the RUP product manager, I looked at Scrum and said, "Is that it? You know, 
big methodologies are the only way to go. As RUP, we had a significant methodology we were describing it. And over those 21 years, it's become very evident that actually smaller is actually more. Uh, having that lightweight framework is incredibly powerful, and I think many other organizations have appreciated that, as I have. 90% of Agile teams use Scrum. That was a date. That's a data point from a, a Forrester survey, and you know whether it's 90, whether it's 78, a lot of people are, are doing Scrum. I looked on Amazon and found over 100. I stopped counting over 100 books with Scrum in the title. So not just Scrum in the content, but Scrum in the title. And I obviously, being English, ignored all foreign titles. So that's a significant number of books. And uh, you know, there's it add to us in the Scrum Alliance. You've got over half a million people trained on Scrum, and you saw the numbers on assessments. Um, Scrum fills, forms the basis of the majority of agile practices and agile approaches. Click to the next slide, please, Betty. So we should celebrate, hey? It's you know, 21 years. It's been incredibly successful. Most teams use Scrum. I know that Tasktop. Uh, has a number of Scrum teams and the, the, the roles of product ownership and Scrum Master and, and Scrum Developer are, are a key part of the, the mantra of Tasktop. And if you go around to most organizations, you find that most people are practicing Scrum. So we should celebrate. Yeah, maybe not so much. Click onto the next slide. One thing that's disappointing is that we continue, this is the Standish Chaos Report, our friend Jim Johnson, who produces this material every year. It's a fantastic, fantastic database of, of project success, project failure project characteristics, projects, you know, really interesting. We have the chance to, to, to talk to these guys at Standish and talk to Jim in particular, watch one of his presentations. There's a lot online. I recommend that you do. One thing that we see there from the data is, hmm, 2013, unlike the 13, was a great year. We, we, we obviously increased our success rates. Um, and actually, we kind of, I mean, ignore the 1% or 2%. There's obviously rounding errors. But really, we haven't really improved that much. Now, I would question and you know what challenge really means and is that okay to deliver, but, but ultimately I think we all accept, perhaps that's the reason why you're on this webcast today, that software development is still bloody hard. In fact, if we click to the next slide, Betty, what's disappointing is that most organizations are actually doing something called Water Scrum Full. We see Scrum being at practice very much at the team level. And, and actually helping those teams to deliver great software well, to deliver software, to deliver software maybe in a happy way. Unfortunately, they do it in a constrained environment, an environment that really hasn't, hasn't uh, discarded the mantra of, of water, or the shackles, I should say, of waterfall. You know, we see it with organizations you know, saying, yeah, we're doing Scrum, but we only plan once a year, obviously. Then we tell the Scrum teams what to do. Yeah, self-organization and, uh, and this, this idea of uh, empowered teams seems to be a little bit beyond them. But, but we're doing Scrum. And of course, Scrum, but we only release software three times a year because our customers don't want it more frequently. But we're doing Scrum. So how do you inspect and adapt when you're actually not getting that information back from customers using your software? It's a very disappointing situation, you know, that Water Scrum 4 is still, still there. Click to the next slide. Uh, please, Betty. And actually, you know, just when we think about done, so a, a, a very key element, though, you know, very challenging in most organizations, a key element of Scrum is this idea of potentially shippable increment at the end, at least at the end of each, each sprint. Now, what's interesting is that potentially shippable usually means that you know, that it actually has been tested, it actually works, it's actually deployable. But it's, it's interesting, this piece of data, this is a Redmond survey, uh, working with Bitmania, and one thing is that the percentage of people using CI is relatively small. And then you look at that, the manual build processes, oh my God, and you look at that with no CI at all, oh my, you, you, that just really sums up the, the maturity of our, of our industry. And, and as they try to scale, Scrum, this becomes a real problem. Click to the next slide, please, Betty. In fact, when we look at you know organisations when they put themselves, can, where, where would you put yourselves on this, ladies and gentlemen? Where would you put you know uh, yourselves on on this on this little graph that we have, on this model that we have? You think of development operations and and dare I call it business insight or or some other term. This idea that so, you know, when you actually deliver working software, it has all these characteristics. It, you've gone through this entire thing. Your, your, your definition of done includes all these, all these elements. Well, if 
we click to the next slide, you'll see that there's a lot of initiatives in our industry today to try to fix this. You know, it's a sort of buzzword bingo is manifest over and over again in this, uh, in this world. In fact, one thing that we see is that organizations strive to at least get development uh, definition of done to include everything necessary to get up to that operations boundary. So you deliver potentially shippable software unless operations don't want to ship it or potentially shippable when they want to. You know, the potentially is their choice, not the product owners, interestingly. Um, DevOps movement is driving us to try to extend that to include deployed, managed, and in production. In fact, that's is an interesting point that I see over and over again with Scrum implementations. People use the use the sprint review. You know, the, the sprint review is at the is at the end of each sprint. You do a, a, a sprint review and then and a, then a retro. Uh, they use that as a phase gate to releasing working software. Actually, it was never intended in that way. If you talk to to, to Ken, uh, when you talk to you know uh, him about this, he's always assumed that uh, actually the ideal situation is you're inspecting that software. The sprint review is actually on software that's in production. Now, ideally, that's in production and giving us meaningful insights into the into the life cycle. So you can imagine that that allows you to learn, to plan, to get that lean analytics. So ultimately. We need to strive to drive our definition of done, you know, that scrum term, that definition of done, to be inclusive of all of these, these elements. The reality is that most organizations are barely in the green arrow there at the, at the scrum level to, today. So let's click on to the next slide and, and talk a little bit about, so what are we doing at, in, in the scrum community and at scrum.org about this? Well, there's a lot of stuff around scaling. And we're not going to, as Betty said, the topic, you know, actually there's um, uh, a scale professional scrum class happening in, in my office today here in Burlington uh, uh, talking about this and it's two days and that barely scratches the surface. So we're not going to, I'm not going to concentrate on talking about lots and lots of elements around scaling. Instead, I'm just going to focus on how we can scale product delivery. Now, you know, there's, there's many dimensions, you know, the, there's, there's how you can scale in terms of multiple products, multiple teams, mul the whole organization, across the whole organization. I'm not going to be focusing on that. I'm going to be focusing on when you have hundreds of people building software on, you know, on in how you can scale your product delivery capability. So that's really what, what we're focused on. And, and if you click onto the next slide, what we find is most organizations are using Scrum even if they're doing safe, if they're doing DAD, any of uh, these other kind of scaling approaches, less is a, another great example. You know, the, they are using Scrum to scale product delivery inside that framework. So they may not be using Scrum to do the ultimate sort of high-level planning, portfolio planning. They may even not be using it to manage the release train, which is a, a little bit of anathema to, to, to Scrum anyway. But, but they will be using it in the context of development. So it sort of fits. So scaling Scrum is very, very important no matter what you're, what you're, what you're doing, as it were. So click to the, to the next slide, please, Betty. Because what we find, and this is an interesting thing around scale, and, and, and Betty's going to talk a lot about how some technology that can help you to, to get some visibility and transparency, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that when we talk about some a framework for helping you do that. But what we find, interestingly, is one team survives and actually is successful in spite of the environment around it. Scrum provides, if taken as, it, uh, as, 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 as you possibly can, if you know, done properly, even at, at that team level, it provides a vehicle to actually effectively manage in a very chaotic environment. However, so if you click onto the next slide, um, please, Betty. Um, uh, but when you take that and you start adding multiple Scrum teams to that same environment, it actually becomes a lot harder no, which is kind of strange that one team, in fact, the, it's funny, uh, Grady Booch, that well-known sort of software geezer, um, um, I was going to call him a software hippie, I wonder if that's a, a term, sort of like wanders around, um, uh, he's sort of like the, uh, the Yoda of software, he's very chill, uh, lives in Hawaii now, interestingly. Anyway, when you ask him about what the ideal team size is, he says one. If, 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 I, you know, if I need some help, I'll get another person, but that's it. And Scrum very much like that. However, when you start applying 
multiple teams, you start having some interesting crises. So actually, it almost becomes harder rather than easier. You know, you, you sort of like that classic saying, you can't have a baby in a month with nine women. And that's true of software development. However, we're in situations where we, we need that. So <laughs> we need that baby in a month. So that means we have to start thinking about some mechanisms to do that. Now, about two and a half years ago, three years ago, Ken and Scrum.org, um, Scrum.org has the, this concept of the professional Scrum trainers, 100 and, 163 of them, it's always growing, um, and these people are out doing training, doing consulting, doing helping people. So Ken worked with that community and looked at when Scrum was being applied right, and looked at situations like this picture here, and looked at you know, because smart people fix this, you know, they make it work. Um, I know at, at TaskTop, when we scaled and we started having multiple teams, we put in a number of practices to make it work. And uh, so he looked at that and looked at some of those practices, and he, and he took all of that and formulated it into something that we, we call the Nexus. And the Nexus really is a mechanism, a framework, an exoskeleton to Scrum that allows you to effectively manage in a world like this, where you've got multiple teams. Click onto the next slide, please. It allows you to effectively deal with some of these, these challenges of scale development. Because ultimately, you know, when, when you have scaling, you know, coordinating work, managing self-organization, whilst not telling them to allow consistency, fully integrated testing increment, when you have all these teams working together, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to, to work effectively, and the ultimate productivity, the efficiency, the effectiveness of these teams drops remarkably. Or as I like to say, the amount of value that you're getting from each team starts dropping as they have to work with everybody else. So click on to the next slide, please, Betty. So um, at the heart of our scaling approach, the heart of Nexus, and we'll, we'll look in a bit more detail at Nexus in a moment, it focuses on two main things. It focuses on anticipation so and rarefication. So we anticipate, so we identify and resolve and minimize dependencies on an ongoing basis. So those, those nine teams are on that diagram. We basically put in place mechanisms that ensure, that encourage, that help those teams anticipate where the dependencies are that's allowing to effectively mitigate them or manage them in, in a better way. The second part, though, is an interesting point, and this is really, really important, because rarefication, the idea of making something real, to rarefy something, ultimately, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. And so one of the things that we saw over and over again when we talked to the community and we talked, looked at large projects and large programs and large product development initiatives, what we saw is that they were delivering working software, they were delivering to Maine and CIing the hell out of it and actually building and deploying into a, uh, sometimes into, not into necessarily into production, but sometimes into a staging environment very, very frequently. And because of that, problems came up the stack a lot earlier. And because of that, it then fed into the anticipation. So these two ideas, anticipation and rarefication, are the essence of how you scale product delivery. And it's really focused on mitigating dependencies and driving those dependencies out. Um, click onto the next slide, please. So this concept, these ideas of anticipation, and rarefication, the ideas of you know, how you can scale product engineering are all described into something that we call um, a framework or an exoskeleton uh, to Scrum called Nexus. Now, why was it called Nexus? Now, it was not my decision to call it Nexus, it was Ken's, and he just called it it because it, he really likes this idea of a relationship or connection between people or things, and he likes to think of this idea that you build a Nexus to scale your delivery of agility and Scrum. So this idea that we have this Nexus. Now I know if you Google Nexus, you'll find Google, you'll find Google phones, you will find um, uh, the matrix, because that's entering the Nexus. But ultimately, they were using probably the word correctly as well, but this idea of a Nexus in delivery, the idea that you create this, this connection between these large groups of people to deliver something of value. Click on the next, next slide, please. Um, 
that I always throw this one in, exoskeleton, think of Sigourney Weaver in Aliens 2, when she jumps on that thing and starts fighting that horrible alien mother, and um, uh, I believe it was a mother, you know, because it had eggs, didn't it, so it was this awful creature, and think of this as an exoskeleton to scrum that allows you to effectively fight aliens, uh, and, which is obviously what And it makes Sigourney Weaver more powerful. It makes that's an interesting point. It makes you more powerful. That's a good that's a good term for an exoskeleton. <laughs> so let's click onto the next slide and actually see what that exoskeleton looks like. This is this is the Nexus. Now the Nexus, as you can see, um, has the same characteristics of Scrum. If, uh, it, it has a product backlog. So the idea is you've got multiple teams working to the same product backlog. That really helps when you're looking at anticipation. You'll notice refinement is actually now an event, first class event. You'll notice that the Nexus Sprint planning happens uh, and you have this concept of a Nexus Sprint backlog which is the aggregation of the work that you're going to do across all your teams to deliver that working increment for that sprint. You'll see that you've got the teams working and then you will see that um, that you have the, uh, something called the Nexus Daily Scrum, which sort of supersedes, uh, it is in prior to the Daily Scrum as a mechanism for ensuring you get that transparency. Now, interestingly, Scrum has two inspection and adaption loops, and Nexus has the same. Um, Scrum has an inspection and adaption loop on a daily basis. That's what the Daily Scrum is. It's not a status meeting. Don't believe anybody that says that. Three questions kind of encourage you to do that. I don't use personally three questions. I always walk the board now. But um, and then it has an inspection and adaption on the sprint level, and that's where the uh, sprint review. Nexus has the same. Nexus sprint review. You'll see that the retrospective is a little bit more complex, um, and you'll see that Nexus sprint planning is a little bit more complex. But ultimately, you're still delivering that integrated increment. And uh, you'll notice another set of responsibilities or another responsibility called the Nexus integration team. That is a new role in Nexus, really, because we identified in most of these organizations that there was a group of people who felt responsible for ensuring that the integration challenges of that, of that, in that endeavor, that Nexus, were being resolved. And that is embodied in something that we call the NIT. Click onto the next slide, please. So guess what? Looks very similar to Scrum, hey? Yeah, no surprise there. It's an exoskeleton to Scrum. We've added some, some stuff. Now, refinement, obviously, and this idea of the NIT and uh, an additional set of events. In fact, if you click to the next slide, Betty, you will see that actually when you look at that in the context of Scrum and Nexus together, you'll see that actually there's only uh, an additional, I think, eight things. Nexus integration team is probably one of the most interesting ones in terms of events, sprint planning, Nexus sprint planning, daily Scrum, all of these things, refinement is a first class citizen uh, and an event, and obviously in artifacts, the, sprint, the Nexus sprint backlog and the Nexus goal are are very important artifacts that's, that, that augment the standard Scrum that you will see. Um, so if we click to the, to the next slide. Really, what Nexus provides us with is remember that we're scaling product delivery. Yes, it doesn't talk about how your enterprise architects or your PMO or, your, or e even uh, how your support organizations work in an agile way. No, it's not focused on that. However, it's focused on really something very important, which is this idea of scaling product delivery. Now, Scrum, 21 years of Scrum, or in October, has been incredibly successful at the team level of allowing us to be more agile at the team level. Unfortunately, most organizations, when they try to scale it, they, they, they fail quite miserably. And what Nexus provides us with is instead of trying to solve every problem, trying to change the culture of your organization, what instead we focus on is allowing teams of teams that are focused on the same endeavor, call that a product backlog, to work together. And the challenge that they have working together today is predominantly around dependencies and about how you manage that, those dependencies. So if we click to the next slide and talk a little bit about then those challenges that we identified earlier, you will see that Nexus is very much focused on getting sharing that goal, coordinating that work, allowing consistency whilst allowing self-organization, allowing integrated testing software to pop out, managing dependencies, and removing and minimizing 
those dependencies effectively with verification and anticipation. Sprint planning is obviously um, anticipation, verification is obviously the sprint review, the next to sprint review. So um, that's really what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to set the scene and provide some context for how, how Nexus and how scaling Scrum can really help based on the success of Scrum over the last 20, 21 years in October. So if we click onto the next slide, I believe Betty would like to talk a little bit about some of the other challenges. I would indeed. Yeah. So, so thank you so much, Dave. I think you know Nexus and the Nexus integration team has definitely given us a framework on uh, on how to use Scrum when product development exceeds kind of that three to nine practitioner recommended size. But there are other challenges, as you as you described, uh, in large organizations. The teams aren't just larger; they're they're broader. Uh, they're geographically dispersed, not just because the organization does development in various locations, but also because the modern, the modern software is really uh, often a mashup of various components, kind of like the manufacturing supply chain. Software is also constructed by software components created by different suppliers. Uh, and of course, when you're working in a large organization, uh, particularly in regulated industries, governance and compliance issues uh, raise their heads, and the stakeholders uh, that, that worry about those uh, play a very strong part in software delivery. So not only are they broader, but the f and I think you alluded to uh, some of these specializations, Dave, uh, there, are, uh, there are other specialists outside the Scrum team. Maybe they end up in the NIT team, the Nexus integration team. We, I guess that that is. Uh, I'm, I'm not completely clear on that, but um, but there are these specialist, specialists specialists those that worry about enterprise a whole bunch of architectures enterprise architecture business process architecture data architecture and administration the user experience design folks and and certainly the specialists for performance and security test all of these specialists do exist at the enterprise scale when we're building big software. Um, we do tend to specialize a, a, a bit more. It's it interesting, Betty, just so you asked yeah. a question around around the NIT. And yeah. what we find is, I mean, the NIT has a very clear responsibility, which is to deliver working software. It's to basically remove those impediments, to deliver in, an in, in the, that increment, that, that, that potentially shippable increment, um, at, at least at the end of each, each Nexus sprint. Now, what we find is that to do that requires those specialists. And they, mm. we often find those specialists work in that integration team and provide, usually in, in a successful organization, they coach the scrum teams to effectively, you know, do the things that you highlighted there, you know, maybe there's some issues with business process, maybe there's some issues with UX, there's often issues with performance and security testing, uh, you know, they draw, hopefully they teach many people to fish, that's the most scalable model, however, sometimes you find that, that they don't do that. Now, you know, ideally, that would be the, the best model, but you're right. That's where you'd see those those nits, and and interestingly, and you'll probably come to this. You know, challenging is then to get that level of transparency drive down into all these teams working with that. Right, and that is the ultimate challenge, right? I think a lot of what you were talking about is is the uh, the level of communication uh, that needs to go on as as teams get larger and larger is is incredibly difficult. It's you know, Grady Booch might might actually be able to create a large scale application by himself, but the rest of us are mere mortals, um, and we we do need tend to, we do tend to need help. <laughs> At least I certainly would. So I think, Dave, you you know you you hit upon some of this as well. This notion of the enterprise definition of done, that perhaps many uh, Scrum teams right now, their definition of done is uh, to be able to deliver to the ops or the DevOps uh, team. But as we evolve and we adapt a DevOps culture and and perhaps incorporate that into the net as well, uh, the definition of done may go further into operations and into management of the application in production. And from an enterprise perspective, the business uh, really isn't interested in, in done software that's ready to be deployed. Uh, it needs to be deployed. It needs to be in production. And not only that, it has to objectively meet the customer demand. Um, and, and then finally, there is, uh, you know, working at an enterprise level really demands a greater visibility 
across the entire software development and delivery lifecycle, as you, as you were alluding, Dave. The business really isn't interested in our burn down charts of user stories. The business needs to be sure that the investment they've made in the application is sound, that it conforms to the standards for governance and compliance for the entire lifecycle from concept to cash. They love to use that phrase. So in large-scale development, software development, the need for governance and visibility is absolutely a reality, uh, even when some agilists, not us, speak as though it's a, a dirty word. You know, I, I like to turn that on its head. After all, one of the tenets of Scrum, this notion of empiricism that you were mentioning earlier, this notion of using uh, systematic inspection and adaptation to kind of guide our work in a complex environment. Well, that really does require the capability of making these ob observations and, and, dare I say, maybe even collecting metrics. Um, we, we always need to know where things stand, uh, but we also need this information for one of the tenets of agility, this notion of continual improvement, uh, including, as you were saying, removing bottlenecks and impediments. So fundamentally, in scale development, we're talking about a life cycle from inception of a business initiative through development, product delivery, into production, and back again. Uh, so where, you know, where does Scrum fall into kind of this end-to-end -end, uh, life cycle view? Um, we have our nexus for providing the framework for product delivery. Um, we start with the product backlog. The, the bit at the beginning. Uh, we we uh, conclude by having an integrated done increment. Um, but as you were saying, the reality uh, often is water scrum fall. There, there really are uh, certain uh, planning exercises that, that go on b before we actually have a product uh, backlog, um, such as the definition of, um, of, a, of a business initiative, the funding of that business initiative, maybe the, the creation of uh, high-level uh, business requirements, business ethics, uh, and, uh, and practitioners that, that work on that, that funnel all of that information, all that, that kind of uh, beginning uh, planning information into the product backlog. And then once the Scrum team has successfully provided our our integrated increment into production, uh, we do have uh, folks that are busily doing all sorts of other activities like performance monitoring and security monitoring uh, and, and the like. Um, and of course, they have, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have to talk about tools. They have all uh, a panoply of tools uh, that help them uh, engage in this work. You know, I think um, very often we hear agilists look to the manifesto and they scream individuals and interactions over process and tools, one of the, uh, one of the tenets. But it, that, I don't think that's meant to say that tools are bad. Uh, it, it, what that's meant to say is tools should not dictate the way we work. We should pick the tools that follow the way we'd like to work and help us uh, get our work done. So, you know, I would, I'd be hard-pressed to say um, that you could actually engage in DevOps thinking without tools and automation. You know, how, how do you do continual integration, continuous test without the necessary automation? Uh, doing this manually simply won't work, not at any scale. So uh, I, I would also venture to say that there's no automation for the tools that are listed here, interestingly. Uh, there's, you know, you, you, there's no way we'll be able to create um, business requirements automatically that requires some, some human smarts. Uh, but we should be able to automate the flow of those requirements from whatever tool a business analyst might be using onto the backlog. And we should do that automatically uh, without manual work. I personally don't believe in automating all tests uh, across the enterprise. I do believe that, uh, that there are professionals that using their professionalism uh, really do have to inspect the software and if they find defects that way. But that notwithstanding, maybe not all tests are automated, but there must be, in my opinion, a way to automatically move the tests, uh, sorry, the defects, wherever they're found, wherever they may be managed, onto that backlog, just to make the Scrum team's life uh, more, more uh, easy. So the, the testing that happens in the Scrum team, those defects might be managed right there on the product backlog. Uh, but there are those other tests, for example, automated tests and scans to verify builds, uh, performance tests, uh, help desk problems that 
eventually are triaged and become defects. These all represent defects that may be discovered and managed elsewhere uh, in the life cycle, but they all need to go on the, on the product backlog. So let's insert humans back in here. Um, all these tools are, uh, are used to enhance the productivity of each of these disciplines and to create artifacts that, that really should be shared, as, as I was just talking about, from practitioner to practitioner. The irony, of course, is that because these tools are not in any way, shape, or form connected, they're very much standalone tools, the artifacts that should be shared, that are created from one uh, specialist and should be shared with other specialists, are, uh, are not, are not, information is not uh, flowing in a very automated way. These, these artifacts are captured within the tools each of these practitioners uh, use and actually create a breakdown in collaboration and a breakdown in visibility. And all of those things you were saying, Dave, earlier about enhancing communication uh, among all of the, the practitioners are actually uh, the, uh, the lack of, of integration here really creates an impediment to that. So I, I would say, of course, that we need to be able to draw a line uh, across all of these tools. We need to break down those silos. We need to integrate those tools. We need to connect the people and automatically connect, co sorry, collect the information, the effectiveness of the life cycle into dashboards and reports illustrated there in order to find the bottlenecks and remove the impediments. I can't help uh, but mention uh, that that is what TaskTop does. Uh, we integrate all of these specialist tools, the tools that the Scrum team uses for agile planning and, and their test tools, with the planning tools like the PPM tools that, that the PMO is using, requirements management, the DevOps tools for continuous integration, automated tests, continuous delivery, um, the, the tools that the operations team uses like uh, application performance monitoring and the like. We synchronize the artifacts that should be shared. Those are the artifacts that are in the middle of the screen box that should be shared from practitioner to practitioner. We move them along this, the life cycle from tool to tool. So each practitioner uses their favorite tool, yet the artifacts are automatically shared with their colleagues. So for example, the defects. Um, if the, the, the Scrum team might have one tool for the backlog, um, the automated tests and code scans um, that, are, that are done before after the build is done, but before production, the help desk uh, uh, problems that are triaged into defects, they all have to make it onto the Scrum team's backlog. And today, that's done fairly manually. Uh, the individuals are either uh, rekeying the information from these other systems onto the, the backlog through the Agile uh, planning tools, uh, or they're doing um, horrible things like sending information in, in email uh, about those artifacts, but the artifacts themselves aren't flowing until you get this kind of infrastructure that TaskUp represents to move them to move them along. Um, not having this infrastructure, uh, using email, using uh, status meetings to uh, not, not to uh, to talk about how to improve our our, our work as in a, a, a retrospective, but just to report on, let's say, the status of an, a defect, whether it's open or in process or fixed and ready to be verified, uh, that, that really is the antithesis of agility. Uh, and I would say it's, it's really not possible to succeed in any kind of agile transformation without this kind of automation. This really does uh, provide us this automation across this value stream, the, the life cycle that I was, I was mentioning. It's agility, it takes this agility beyond the scrum team to the left and to the right, the water and the, the fall. Um, heavens forbid, I can't believe I just said waterfall. Um, but takes it across the entire, uh, the entire value stream to eliminate this manual work to, to uh, eliminate the information scavenger hunt that goes on every day among practitioners, uh, which invariably increases uh, capacity and, and decreases the time it takes to get any given thing done, the time it takes to, uh, to create a, uh, uh, a piece of business value and put it into production, the time it takes to, uh, to fix a defect and, and put it into production. It also increases the visibility. So the life cycle analytics that are collected by dint of watching all of the work that's happening, all the information that's flowing, 
that information is automatically collected uh, so that uh, gone are manual traceability reports or reports of any kind and governance uh, issues. They're all, all of this information is collected and can be reported uh, from a cross-discipline perspective. We do this every day. Uh, TaskTop is, is uh, very fortunate to, uh, to support many of the largest uh, companies in the world in, in their endeavors. Uh, as you can see here, uh, over a third of the Fortune 100 really relies on, on our products to help improve their software development and, and delivery practices. So, fortunately, we were able to do this so that we could entertain some questions. So I think, Dave, you and I covered quite a bit of ground here. Uh, today, we, as promised, didn't talk about uh, much about pe people and culture, although we, we couldn't help to dip our toes in there. Um, I think we, we've learned quite a bit about how Nexus can really help extend the, the notion of Scrum uh, to much larger uh, product development teams, and the creation of a, an infrastructure using the tools that exist uh, today in that life cycle in order to, uh, to facilita facilitate communication and to, uh, to be able to observe, inspect, and, uh, and remove barriers to, to success. It, it, it's interesting, Betty, because ultimately agility is about being able to implement the inspect and adapt model using transparency. You know, you, you need to be able to effectively do that. What you described was the fact that because of the fragmented life cycle, the reality of Water Scrum fall into your product delivery organization, that it's impossible to get that transparency. Therefore, it is impossible to anticipate, um, you know, effectively, and it's impossible to inspect and adapt. I think that, you know, the, the, the idea of transparency, the idea of something that helps that flow, and yes, the NIT would obviously take advantage of something like this, but ultimately, it's the teams that get that transparency. Also, you talked a little bit about the, the, the fact that the flexibility that, that by using something like TaskTop will allow those teams to use, because those teams, though they may be in a nexus working from the same virtual product backlog, it's possible that backlog's fragmented into different tools. Sure. So this gives us the ability to glue all of them together in a way without making them change. Uh, um, you know, one of the most worrying characteristics of scale is that suddenly you tell people exactly what they're, to, they're doing and how to do it. Uh, we all know that in the, 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 the world of knowledge work and the, 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 the world that we live in, that t by telling people what to do it, you instantly reduce their effectiveness. And, and I think that, you know, the model that you described was all about providing an infrastructure to facilitate that, that flexibility and that whilst ensuring that transparency and, and enabling us to um, anticipate appropriately and then react when, when, that, uh, when, that, when things happen that we don't want to happen. It is, it is hard to anticipate something you cannot see. <laughs> it is, it is, <laughs> though uh, I think, uh, yes, obviously Daredevil from Marvel would, con would disagree with you there, but uh, Oh, you guess. would pick on an area I have no domain expertise. Thanks, Dave. Call yourself a geek. I so, know. <laughs> um, have we got any questions at all? I have no idea. I've used this app, so go to waiting webinar. So, Sarah, yes. is there any uh, any Luckily questions I'm... or comments? Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone as well. If you do uh, have any questions, go ahead and put them in the questions panel um, that GoToWebinar provides, and I will ask them to Dave and Betty. So uh, we do have a few that came in. Um, we have one uh, who said, why are there so many models for scaling Agile? There's Safe, there's Dad, and now Nexus. <laughs> Isn't it confusing? Um, Isn't and kind it of com com complicating the whole thing. Isn't it confusing? Yes. There's, you know, so uh, I ask myself that frequently. Um, I, the, the, the challenge with scaling, I mean, the ultimate challenge with scaling is that it is a very broad topic supporting many different types of organizations, types of different domain. It's almost impossible to provide a one size fit or in fact I believe it is impossible. And what you see is you see with you know Nexus we definitely came from a place of strength. We we know with Scrum and hopefully you guys are using it on this on the, on the line, we know how to enable teams to deliver in a very agile way. 
we Nexus just harvested the best practices. You know, notice Scrum of Scrums isn't in it, though a lot of people are doing something like that, and that's what some of those mechanisms, particularly the the Nexus um, daily Scrum, is all about. You know, we harvested those best practices and brought them together into the framework. We focused on the areas that we had strength, and we built out a framework that supported that. You'll see with Dad. Uh, I would say you'd see with SAFE that uh, you see that they're doing similar things. They're approaching it SAFE and DAD very much from a methodologist process sort of point of view, whereas we are very much more focused on a on a scrum, very light framework kind of point of view. Less is interesting because it is just, you know, large enterprise scaled scrum. So it, it, it has a lot of nexus in it, though it goes further. It talks a lot more around the planning areas. So I guess the answer to your question is, I would hope that all of these um, scaling groups, whether it's Dean, Scott, uh, Baz, and Craig, are actually approaching it from their own area of expertise and building out ideas that are good at that. I don't believe there's a single human being that has all the answers to solving the agile at scale. I do believe that there's a lot of great thoughts in the marketplace at the moment. However, a word of caution. Agility isn't easy, and thinking that you can take your existing organization, relabel it, and make it agile is not true. The reality is that there is no silver bullet, there is no tool, there is no way you can buy agility at scale. So I would question anybody that thinks that they can just take a framework, even a framework like Nexus, and just say, oh, yeah, I'm scaled, I'm scaled agile now. You're not. What you have to do is it's a long journey, and you should use Nexus for helping you scale your product delivery. You should look at other places and look at and try to learn from those, and then, unfortunately, scaling Agile requires you to change, and uh, you can't just buy it. So I don't know if that answered your question. I probably got a little philosophical, but hopefully it did. I wouldn't mind interjecting a little philosophy myself. I think very often, you know, there, there can be one true model if there is one true way of doing any any one thing. Uh, but software development is difficult, as we all know. Uh, it is a it is a complex and creative endeavor, and it is also a very important and key business process for uh, for companies that employ it. Uh, and just like any other business process, they vary from company to company. Very often, a company can actually differentiate themselves on how they build software. So de depending on how an organization uh, uh, creates their business practice of software development, one, one model might, uh, might seem best over another. But I don't even think, I think the problem we've got, the sheer variety of, vari of, of the sheer variety of in, in these situations, like you've got different people coming from different backgrounds mm -hmm. with different experiences, you've got different technologies, you've got different legacy systems with different constraints, you've got different businesses with different business constraints, you've got different market opportunities with different market you know, constraints, you've got you know, different funding, different cash flow, different governance, different compliance. You add up all those things, is it possible just to buy or adopt one framework? I don't think it is. I think the reason why Ken kept Scrum and keeps Scrum very, very light, the reason why it's, what, 16 pages in the Scrum Guide and Nexus isn't many more, is because what it, it, it's so light that you can apply it in your organization, that it doesn't come with any baggage or assumptions of it's only, this only works. There's no if-thens in Scrum. There's Scrum. And uh, unfortunately, when you start adding more context and you start adding more to support this type of organization or this type of problem, then you have to start putting in a lot more complexity. And I found this with RUB. We were, I was always asked two things. Oh, can you add all these new things? Oh, and can you make it simpler uh, and easier to implement? And ultimately, I couldn't. I could add more things, but it didn't make it easier to implement. And I, well, I could make it easier to implement, which meant you'd have to do more thinking. You know, it, it's, it's, very, it's a very challenging problem, Betty, I think. It is indeed. Anyway, one question took us like two hours. <laughs> Sorry, as I said, a challenging problem. I think we we can talk about any one of these things for probably an entire week. Sorry, I shouldn't. No, so I really more questions. 
Uh, any more questions, Sarah? Yes, definitely. Um, can you comment on how Nexus and the NIT may be able to assist with integration of teams like SAP? Oh, interestingly, actually, Nexus has been applied in a big SAP rollout, and I recently had the fortune to be in Europe, and that this person cornered me and, and talked a lot about it. One of the uh, and, and we're talking about really the, the the dependencies. So they were talking about rolling out uh, the, the, in an upgrade going to whatever R3M or whatever. I don't. I got completely lost when they talked about the SAP stuff. But but what I what was what I got from the conversation was one of the biggest challenges they had was the dependencies outside the scrum teams. And one great thing about the NIT is it provides you with a mechanism to bring people from outside of Scrum, which has never been done before, woo that and bring them into your Nexus and have them basically uh, the most scalable way is coaching the teams to deal with these issues. The less scalable way is managing the, the external parties that are dealing with those issues. Um, but, but, but ultimately, you have this embodiment of people who are responsible for basically removing those impediments. Now, you might say, wasn't that the Scrum Master's job? The reality is, and, and it is, but the reality is when you scale, is and when I say when you say job responsibility to facilitate and to enable and to and to coach, but but the, when you scale, is that you you need somebody. We found that over and over again. You need a group of people. It's cross discipline. It's cross skills. It's often people outside of delivery, including people in delivery, and they need to work together and help and make decisions about things and and raise priorities and manage politics and all that crap to make it work. So in SAP, what you find is those dependencies, those dependencies on those external, you can get that and you can embody that and you can help anticipate and verify, drive that into the teams. So yes, very much, the NIT is a great mechanism for managing SAP implementations but because of the sheer number of external dependencies on those implementations. Great. And if you want um, to add anything there, Betty, or, or if we've got any other questions, Sarah? We do have more, if, if Betty doesn't want to inter interject. No, 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 let's go ahead with the other questions as well. Um, can either of you, sh or both of you, share some best practices around traceability of requirements across the life cycle in a water scrum fall project environment for a large regulated enterprise? Uh, yeah, that's something we see a, a lot of, uh, frankly, um, be, be, because of the regulated um, uh, regulations and the compliance issues. The ability to be able to see from uh, both sides, from both ends of this uh, life cycle, from operations uh, to know whether uh, a, a requirement has actually been implemented and put into production, uh, and from the kind of the beginning when the uh, when the requirement was uh, was created to, to know whether the thing has gone through uh, the development, the, the appropriate tests, um, what the, the appropriate code scans before it made it into production. Um, and, and I would uh, venture to say that having this siloed effect among the tools breaks this kind of uh, traceability that's required. You you can't connect from the uh, the left side all the way to the right side. Gosh, I, I can't believe I'm describing it in a waterfall way. Um, but truth be told, you, there is if the requirements are created and managed in a requirements management system, and then uh, and then implemented uh, in the Scrum teams, and then tested, the build created. Um, uh, the build verified through code scans and automated tests and then put into production. Um, all of those different steps oof, um, are actually governed by separate tools and there is no way other than through integration to be able to actually create a pointer from one step to the next in order to create this, uh, this automated traceability. And in fact, what's going on right now is that um, uh, individuals, human beings, have to go from one tool to the next, uh, see what's happened, and um, and create a spreadsheet that that connects the information from each of these tools onto one spreadsheet. Uh, it has to be done uh, as the as the um, an individual uh, might have insinuated in the question in regulated into enterprises, you simply cannot just throw something into uh, production without it uh, being auditable. Um, uh, so this this manual process happens. I, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm more than slightly biased. Uh, if you have a, a product like Tasktop Sync and data observing the entire process with access to all of the tools, we can actually create this traceability uh, from the beginning of that requirement into production automatically. And that is a best practice. I yeah, I've got, no, I've got nothing really to, to, to add to that apart from don't treat your development, your requirements people separate to your Scrum teams. Scrum, Scrum teams need to have those requirements people inside them and they're not product owners. It's a specialist skill that particularly in regulated in, in those sort of industries where you, it's very important to, to have that sort of abstraction, that separate abstraction. It's a specialist skill. Product owner might be able to do it, but likely there's a it's an it's an additional role, additional set of skills that you need for your Scrum developer to to have, and um, and hopefully keep them in your team, and then take advantage of automation to to fill the that linkage up as you as you move through delivering continuously working software at least at the end of the the the, the sprint nexus. Absolutely. Great, thank cool. you guys. I think that's all the questions that we have time for for today, but um, if you do have other questions, we'll get back to you um, after the webinar. Uh, Betty, I think there is one more slide, if you could advance, uh, yes, just so of course. people can see. Um, now, of course, scrum.org, the website is in the name as well, so you can obviously <laughs> learn more on scrum.org. Um, but if you'd like to see a demo of TaskTop to see how this integration that Betty talked about works, you can go to tasktop.com slash demos. If you have any other questions, you can go to tasktop.com slash contact dash us, and we will get your questions answered, and we can talk about lifecycle integration. They're all always, there's always a lot on tasktop.com that you can learn in our resources section as well. Unless there's any final closing comments from Betty or Dave? I think that will conclude our webinar. No, have a have a good day. It's been great talking to you. The pleasure's been online. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dave. Thank, Thank you, you, guys.